All right then everyone, we are at the end of section 10.2. This is 10.2 day three. We're gonna be looking at the tests for a difference in means. So yesterday we did the confidence interval. This time we're doing the test. Let's see how that goes for us, okay? So according to the Stanford Business article, Americans may eat fewer calories in restaurants if the calorie of food items were labeled on the menu. The investigate uh, are labeled on the menu. Oh, let's learn how to read. Uh, to investigate this, researchers compared Starbucks receipts from locations where the menus were labeled with uh, to receipts from stores where label where the menus were not labeled. So in a random sample of 30 receipts, yes, 30, um, from stores with the menus labeled, there was an average caloric number of calories of 225 with a standard deviation of 100 calories. And from a random of sample of 40 receipts, yes, 40. Um, sorry, a random sample of 40 receipts from stores without menus labeled showed an average of 225 calories per receipt and a standard deviation of 75. So does this provide convincing evidence that the average number of calories per receipt at Starbucks with a labeled menu is less than that of um, a Starbucks without labeled menus? So let's go ahead and isolate. Let's isolate the numbers that are important. So first of all, let's take a look for any means. Where are the means? Well, the first one's 225. The second one is 265. Okay, and next one, how about we look at standard deviations? There's a the standard deviation 100, standard deviation of 75. Last thing, how about sample size? Sample size, that first one is 30. I got excited there because that will allow us to use the CLT. The other sample is 40. So I think we've got everything um, labeled. We are ready to start this uh, procedure. So state plan, do, conclude. State, what is the parameter? I'm going to get you started with what is mu1 minus mu2? What is that? Okay, so as you can see, mu1 minus mu2 is the true difference in mean calorie intake. Uh, statistics, x bar 1 minus x bar 2, those are the numbers in yellow. It's 225 minus 265 which is negative 45. Next for you guys, uh, what about the hypotheses? Remember, you're gonna need an H naught and an H A, and they better be about X uh, mu one minus mu two. Pause it here, throw in those hypotheses. Okay, so the two hypotheses we're gonna to wanna to test are mu one minus mu two is equal zero versus the alternative mu one minus mu two is less than zero. This says that the caloric intake from the restaurants with a labeled menu is less than the caloric intake from a label from a restaurant without a labeled menu. Of course, we're only looking at Starbucks. Well, there's our state. Now we got to get to plan. So we've got name of procedure and check conditions. I'll let you do those. Uh, you should be writing down something about the central limit theorem because remember when I got excited about those sample sizes? That's right. Okay, go ahead and write those down and we'll get back to you in a minute. Okay, so random. Uh, the problem itself states random. I think we have that highlighted up here. No, we don't have it highlighted. Let's highlight the word random. Random sample. And then there's another random sample right here. So since we have random samples, a random condition has been met. 10% condition. 
Uh, 10 times n1 is 300, 10 times n2 is 400. So that means we need to have more than 300 and 400 receipts from labeled and unlabeled restaurants respectively. That's not too much of a stretch of the imagination. Finally, and this is the exciting one, is both samples are greater than or equal to 30, so both samples qualify for the central limit theorem. And just for um, review, remember that the central limit theorem says that if a sample size is large enough, which we interpret to mean greater than 30, that means that the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. All right, final, not the final part, the next, next part here is the do part. Let's get the mean and the standard deviation. Let's get numbers for those uh, formulas and numbers, and we'll go ahead and uh, calculate that. Um, go ahead and do that right now. OK, there we go. Mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. Remember that that comes from h0. There is also here your um, formula for the standard deviation. That comes from our box, right? That's from Uh, where is that from? That is from the, uh, yeah, the addition of the variances. So we got 21.77, we got zero. We're ready for a general formula and a picture and a specific formula. Go ahead and work on that. General formula, picture, and specific formula. Okay, I had a little bit of trouble filling all this stuff in there, fitting all this stuff in here, but you can see the specific formula here x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus 0, that was our null, divided by the standard error that we got from our previous, uh, yeah, learning target. <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, the picture that we're doing here, that is a normal curve. And I'm seeing that the normal curve is obscuring the standard deviation formula a little bit. So I'm going to move that. But I've labeled 0 for differences, which is a z-score of 0. I've labeled a difference of 21.77, which is a z-score of positive 1. Negative 21.77 is a z-score of negative 1. And then I found my statistic, which was negative 40, way down over here on the left. And then I have yet to find a z-score or t-score for that. So we're going to do that next. Uh, so far, uh, everything looks good. Go ahead and do the work, test statistic, and then p-value, and then we'll be right back in a second. Okay, here is our uh, specific formula, our uh, work, and that gets us to a t-score uh, test statistic of negative 1.837. How many degrees of freedom are we going to have? Well, the smallest sample is 30, so 30 minus 1 is 29. That's going to be our degrees of freedom. Let's write that right over here. df is going to be equal to uh, 30 minus 1, or 29. All right, your last task here is to figure out your p-value. So go ahead and take a minute to do that, p-value. Okay, so we're getting a p-value of 0 0.058, which is somewhat bigger than our significance level. So I think we're going to fail to reject our null hypothesis here, and which means we're ready to go ahead with our conclusion. Go ahead and write that up. Here's that set phrase that goes along with the conclusion of a t-test. Uh, now all you have to do is fill in the blanks. Go ahead and do that. And I'm thinking I'm gave you, I gave you the wrong set phrase. This is a set phrase for p-value. So this says that assuming there is no difference in the average number of calories between stores is true, um, then there's a 5.8% probability of a sample size sizes of 40 and 30 having a difference as less at less than negative 40 by chance. So that's not actually for our um, conclusion. That's uh, interpreting our p-value. Here's that set phrase for the conclusion, hopefully. 
Okay, now you can go to town, finish up, write, fill in the blanks, and I'll pause here for you. So since the p-value is greater than alpha, the data does not support that the true number of calories consumed is greater in unlabeled restaurants. So that is our entire thing here. That, man, that was, a, that was a challenge, wasn't it? A lot to do. Let's get to, here is our um, important ideas. Let's get to filling that out. Okay, so not a lot, whole lot to this one. Um, if we've been doing these for a while, we have been doing these for a while now. So learning target is pretty simplified. The T-score, as you can see, that is the difference in X bars minus the difference of mu's. By the way, the difference of mu's is usually zero. Um, usually zero. Also on our denominator, we can substitute sigma with s. And that means that if you do that, you're going, you're looking at the T curve, which we should be doing every time we do a test. So that is not a very convincing looking arrow. Um, let's try that again. All right, that's a better looking arrow. All right, your p-value is a TCDF, uh, lower limit, upper limit, degree of freedom. And of course, your curve is going to be a T. Don't forget your degree of freedom where the DF is equal to N minus one, where N is the smallest N. All right, that brings us to our check your understanding. Let's take a minute to read through that and then I'm gonna have you guys do the entire thing at one time. Uh, you're gonna do all the state plan do and conclude. So how quickly do synthetic fabrics such as polyester decay in landfills? Uh, a researcher buried poly polyester strips in soil for four different lengths of time and then dug them up and measured the force required to break them. Breaking strength is easy to measure and is a good indicator of decay. Lower strength means that the fabric has decayed more. For one part of the study, the researcher buried 10 strips of polyester in a well-drained soil. The strips were assigned to two groups. Five were buried for two weeks and the other five were buried in 16 weeks. Here are the breaking strengths. Uh, do the data give convincing evidence that the, de the polyester decays more in 16 weeks than in two weeks? So remember that if it decays more in 16 weeks, then uh, the breaking strength will be less. Okay, so take a minute here, try to get those. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna, we're going to do the state part together, and then I'll turn you loose for the rest of that, okay? So do the state part. I'll be back in a minute. Um, pause it here. Okay, hopefully this sets you up for success. You've got state mu1 and mu2 is a true difference in mean strengths. Our hypotheses mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. Uh, and alternatively, mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. So if mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero, that means mu1 is greater than mu2 which means that the strength after two weeks is greater than the strength after 16 weeks, which means that 16 weeks um, is decayed more than 12 weeks, two weeks, sorry, two weeks. Um, we've calculated X bar one minus X bar two. It's 7.4 and I should probably make that a minus sign and our alpha level is 0 0.05 because nothing was stated. Okay, folks, go ahead and do the plan, do and conclude, and I'll come back with a review. Pause it right here. 
Okay, we've got the entire thing in one shot here. The name of the test is a two sample t-test for mu1 minus mu2. Um, it did say that they were randomly assigned into either group one or group two. 10% uh, rule, well then I assume that there is more than 50 strips of polyester for, but uh, really the idea here is to make sure that things are independent and uh, you know, these should be independent samples. Uh, normality, we do have small samples, so we need to check their dot plots. I've done a drawing of their dot plots over here. And remember that since this is for a test, you don't have to be super exact on these. You don't have to, you know, go with all the bells and whistles. Just, we were just checking to see if it's reasonably symmetric and it does make sure that there's no outliers. So yeah, these are reasonably symmetric and no outliers. So we can we can conclude that you know normality condition is going to hold here. Do part test statistic stat minus null over standard deviation, which is t x bar one minus x bar two over you know square root of s one squared over n one plus n two squared s2 squared over n2, we got 0 0.99 and then the p-value, the probability that t is greater than 0 0.99, uh, that got us to uh, 0.189, that's a pretty big p-value. One thing that I forgot to put here was degree of freedom, so your degree of freedom is equal to, uh, smallest sample is 5, so our degree of freedom is equal to 4. That's what we used for our TCDF. Okay, conclusion. Since the p-value is greater than alpha, or the data does not support that polyester buried for 16 weeks is more decayed than polyester buried for two weeks. Now I know what you're saying. The numbers seem smaller for group two. So yes, you're right. And remember that this isn't saying that, this isn't necessarily saying that polyester buried for 16 weeks is, um, is not more decayed. It's saying that we can't detect it using the stats that we have. A uh, couple things you could do to make sure that you can detect it if there is a difference. You can clearly take a bigger sample or bigger samples, uh, samples of size five and five, aren't very big and they shouldn't or it's unlikely that those samples are going to detect any differences. So bigger samples maybe we would get something that is more um, detectable. Um, so there it is section um, 10.2 day 3 Good luck, everyone. Have a good one. We'll see you next time.